After afternoon, everyone, my name is Julie from New England Spring QIO. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar series, Session 6, Communication Tools, Part 2. The Quality Innovation Network, Quality Improvement Organization, works with healthcare providers, stakeholders, and communities across New England and on data-driven quality initiatives to improve patient safety, engage patients and families, and improve clinical care at the community level. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Just before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. This call will be recorded for training purposes. I'll be providing you with details on accessing the recording at the end of this webinar. The phone lines will be on mute for the duration of the presentation. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. I will provide you instructions on how you can ask a question over the phone or pose a question a question in the chat box. Please make sure to send questions to all of the attendees. At this time, I'd like to introduce Carol Dietz. We'll begin this presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Julie, for that nice introduction. My name is Carol Dietz, and I'm one of the um, present presenters for today's webinar on Interact. It's so good for you to join us on this beautiful, beautiful day. Say a prayer, though, a quiet prayer for our, our colleagues and friends in Texas and Louisiana. So today, um, I'm just trying to – okay. Um, today, on today's session, we're going to – um, talk about the use of the SBAR tool to improve communications between caregivers. This is one of the most important tools that any nurse can use to, um, in order to communicate correctly um, between physicians and other nurses. So this is literally one of the key tools of this tool of our toolkit. Also, we're going to be using going to, um, Sheila's going to be talking about the nursing home transfer form and the acute care transfer checklist. Um, we're going to talk also about the, the use of the red envelope, um, which um, we are now starting to use in, in Connecticut to when we have an acute care transfer between a nursing home and a, and a hospital, that all the documents get put in this red envelope so the emergency department will know that A, it's coming from a nursing, the patient's coming from a nursing home, and B, is an acute care transfer. So, again, this is one of the most important, another important tool of the toolbox. Also, Sheila's going to talk about process mapping. This is one of the important quality improvement tools that are used um, when, when doing quality improve, improvement initiatives. So, and then at the very end of, the, end of our session, we're going to talk about the homework that was, was to be completed last month, and then we would love to hear from each of you of how things went, what barriers you you had seen, also what successes you you overcame. And then we'll, we have the homework for this week, or for this month. So that's how the day is going to go. So as we always start, we always talk about the requirements for a participation certificate from from the New England Quinn QAO. Just to remind you that you have to, that a facility, in order to get a certificate of participation, a facility has to have attended at least seven out of the nine webinars, two of which may be viewed online, which means that you're not actually participating, but you're, you're viewing it um, after the event is over. Um, and we do track all of these every month to see who has logged on to watch our webinars. Another requirement is that you need to send Qualidine at least four months of readmission data. We highly recommend that you um, use the safely reduced hospitalization tracking tool, which is in the NNHQI, the, the National Nursing Home Quality Improvement um, um, website. Because with that, once you start submitting your data, you will get some wonderful reports. And we've had two webinars already this, this session on this um, readmission tracking tool. 
um, from the from the nurse who actually developed this tool. So you, you are um, you've had some great resource um, in in her on how to use this tool and how to use the reports and how to actually how to get the reports out of the tracking tool. And you have to have at least four months to call it on. Our feeling is once you've got that fourth month in, you're going to realize how easy it is to, to use this tracking tool, how easy it is to submit it, and what wonderful reports you can get at the end of each month. So by that point, you're going to say, I'm going to continue on this. My facility really appreciates these reports. And then finally, you're not done. And one other requirement is that um, your nursing home administrator needs to complete the um, Interact Tools checklist at the very end of our se uh, after the ninth session. Um, this is basically a, a nice checklist to say where you are right now. We're not expecting you to have every single tool in place or every single process in place. That's, that's not realistic. But what we want you to be is as honest as you can be to say this is where we are because it will also help you with your roadmap of where you will go next year. So with that, um, this, um, if you are to, if you still need to, um, if you're lagging behind, if you need one or two of the webinars to watch to make sure that you're, you're up to that seven minimum webinars, um, they're all posted on the New England Quinn QIO website, and the, the link is right there on the slide. So what you want to do is you're going to click on the events tab, which is right, right on top of the um, web landing page. You're going to scroll down a little bit to the previous event. You're going to click on the month that you want, that you would like to find the session that you've missed. Then you're going to actually click on the recording link. And before you actually get to the recording, you have to complete um, some personal in information, who you are and what nursing home you are working for. Because that's, that's what we're tracking. We're not tracking the person. We're tracking the facility. So you, we want to make sure that you put the right nursing home in before you um, are able to download the webinar. So these are our webinar dates um, for this session in 2017, so March, April, May, June, and July. So again, this is a nice handy-dandy little calendar for you um, just to make sure you, you know which webinar you've missed um, so it will be easy for you to, to go ahead and download it. So with that being said, I'm going to turn this over to Sheila Eckenrode, who's going to give the content in information that interact today. Thank you, Carol, and thank you for to all our participants. Um, welcome to Interact. We're glad you're here with us today. I'd like to start by doing a little bit of a, a temperature test of the audience today in terms of what um, tools you might have already implemented. I know that several facilities in this group have already implemented staff and March and SBAR. So I'm going to ask you to take this poll. Um, simple question, yes or no, have you tried to implement SBAR? Are you in the process of implementing SBAR? And if you can just answer that question and be sure to hit submit, we can get a sense of um, how many of the facilities with us today have already implemented the SBAR tool. So we'll take a few seconds to tally that up. Sheila, would you like me to sing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I guess it depends on the song. Um, all right. Okay, don't forget to hit submit. All right. So some folks have implemented SBAR, and congratulations to you. Um, we know that SBAR is an industry standard now. If you have any new grads in your facility, they have been taught this in nursing school that this is the way that you communicate with other clinicians. So congratulations to you. All right. I'm going to ask the same question about Stop and Watch. We talked about Stop and Watch in session four. And participants seem pretty enthusiastic about that, and I know many facilities have started the implementation of Stop and Watch. So if you could answer that question, have you implemented Stop and Watch in your facility? And don't forget to hit the Submit button, and we'll have an idea um, 
where we are with that, and that prevents me from telling you things you already know, which would be rather boring. So, if you could take that full, I'd appreciate it. The in. <laughs> there, there. there we go. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. So, communication tools. Communication tools are really the backbone of the interactive program. If you wanted to give an elevator speech as to what interact is all about, I would recommend you talk about communication and talk about early identification and change in resident conditions. So that's really what we're trying to achieve here, um, putting in place processes and systems that allow us to detect a change in resident condition early and then communicate it clearly, effectively, and in a timely manner. So we're going to talk about some of those communication tools today. Um, again, you can download these from the Interact website. The Interact website has migrated to um, a company or a consortium called Pathways, but the tools are still available. The tools are still free. You'll have to make one extra step, though, to access them. The Pathways group asks that you register. So they're going to ask for your name and they're going to ask for your email. And then they're going to ask you to sign a form electronically where you promise not to steal interact away from them and then you're on and then you can download these tools. So I encourage you after this session to please go on to that website and look at these tools because um, this, this is really something that you want to do if you're going to become an interact facility. And they're still free, so there really is no reason to have to steal them this year. All right. So the interact communication tools we're going to talk about today are the SBAR tool. And again, the SBAR tool is simply a form that allows you, that prompts you to use the SBAR process. SBAR is a process, it's a structured way of communicating. It's developed by the U.S. Navy as a method of communicating um, during emergency situations. So the point of SBAR is to structure communication in a focused way so you're communicating exactly what's wrong, what the problem is at that moment. SBAR should be used when a patient is being transferred from the nursing home to the hospital. But SBAR could also and should also be used anytime clinicians are speaking to each other. So with or without documentation, it's a good practice. And it's, again, if you have um, new grads or new um, docs, they're well-versed in this, you know, a way of structuring and describing a problem that helps the person communicating as well as the person receiving the information focus on the problem at hand. We're also going to talk a little bit about the nursing home transfer form. Um, that's a form that should be completed at any time a resident is transferred from the nursing home to an acute care facility. This is a checklist and a prompt, and it takes the place in the state of Connecticut of the W-10. Um, we worked real hard to make that happen, so please help keep that rhythm going by using this form instead of the W-10. When we review this form, you'll see that it prompts the clinician sending facility and the assessing clinician to include information that's very pertinent, that's very appreciated by the folks on the other side of the, the EMS ride here. So when these forms were developed, um, the group developing them asked the emergency department, what information do you really need that you seldom receive? And they talked about the things like mental status, about code status about ability to walk. These things, we know our residents so well. We know what their baseline is. But remember, these clinicians receiving the patient in the emergency department have no idea if the patient's 
continues that baseline. They don't know where to put the patient in the walk. They don't know if they're a fall risk. So the purpose of the transfer form is to prompt you to include information that's valuable, that ensures safety um, of the resident when they arrive, and that helps the, the ED clinician, the assessing clinician, focus on the problem that you want them to focus on. Again, we all know that when our residents go to the emergency department, this is a, a common lament among um, nursing home staff is that, you know, I sent him for one thing. I wanted him to have an x-ray, and oh my goodness, they found all sorts of things wrong. And a medical student that came in and assessed the resident and gave them 22 new diagnoses, and we'll never get them back. Um, this process is designed to help you as the sending clinician get the results that you're hoping for when you send your resident to, to the emergency department. And then usually the nurses and the APRNs and even the, um, you know, the ancillary staff have a pretty clear idea of what that resident is going to need when they get to the hospital, um, what symptoms that you're hoping will be addressed, what medication changes you're hoping will happen when they get there. So using this checklist is, is helpful to you and it's helpful to the receiving clinicians. Um, also, we're going to talk a little bit about the capabilities list, and this is a document that allows the folks in the emergency department to know exactly what your nursing home is capable of doing in-house. So some nursing homes can do things like TPN and start IVs and some can't. Some nursing homes have the capability to diurese using IV Latex, some don't. Um, so that's important, really important information for the emergency department to have. And Capabilities in nursing homes do change, so you can have this form sort of pre-printed as to what your policies are and to what you can do in-house, and review it maybe every six months to see if your capabilities have changed. And the acute care transfer list is the last document we're going to talk about, and that goes on the outside of the red envelope. We're going to talk a little bit about the red envelope as just being the way all these documents they put together and um, are safely delivered to the person who needs to receive them. Because if you've ever worked in an emergency department, you know how paper flies around there. So let's start a little bit, uh, talking a little bit about SBAR and what it is. And, and um, I want to help you introduce this to your staff in a way that will make it less terrified and awful looking. Um, whenever I roll this out or show this to people, they say, oh, this is way, way, way too long. But it's information that you've probably already gathered. It's information that you've already organized in the process of assessing a resident who's having a change in status. So it's just a matter of the way you're going to structure it. Let's walk through this for a second. We start with the situation. Why are you calling the clinician? So let's say you have a resident who's short of breath. Um, that's a, a common one. Or maybe someone who's fallen. So that's all. It's the situation. This is what's happening. My resident is short of breath. My resident fell. One sentence, okay? There's a couple of check boxes. Easy peasy, um, don't ask for too much. That first one. A couple of things about this form that are so helpful, not only to you, the clinician doing the assessment, but to the clinician receiving the information. The change in condition, what happened? The resident fell, the resident short of breath. When did it start? That's such information is very often dropped. Okay, so it's going to ask you that. Since it started, worse or better, just a checkbox. You might say what makes whatever symptom worse, what makes it better. Anytime something's not relevant, do not try to put a square peg in a round hole. Just put N-A and move on. There's nothing that says every single box on these forms needs to be checked or every piece of information needs to be um, provided. If there's one thing I've learned from working with nurses is we cannot bear to leave a line unfilled. 
you have to get over that and just move on because, again, you're trying to communicate what's happening now. Why is this patient going to the ER this day at this time? So starting with situation. Background asks a little bit about the resident, not a whole lot. It's asking for the primary diagnosis, anything else pertinent. Um, what the resident is in the nursing home for, is it a long-term care resident or post-acute care? Any medication alerts you feel that are important to communicate? Anything maybe about Coumadin, if there's a recent INR, um, insulin, a recent hypoglycemic episode, I mean, these, these are things that, that you want to be thinking about anyways, and now you're given an opportunity to communicate them. Um, section for vital signs, of course, right, under background. So that's pretty simple. Then we get into a big, long review of systems, and this is what terrifies and upsets people. You've got two pages where we go through mental status, functional status, behavioral evaluation, and everyone says, there's no way I have time to do that. And that's true. So if it has nothing to do with the reason you're sending the resident to the emergency department, there's a little box that just says, not clinically applicable, not clinically applicable. So if you're sending someone because they've fallen and there's a evaluation for their loss at the end, it's not applicable. So you just move on. Got to get past that nursing urge to check every box and fill in every line. We're focusing on why today. Why is this patient being sent to the emergency department today? So that's background. So um, reassure your staff that they don't have to go through every system, but the systems that are relevant. So if you're if you're sending someone for a psych eval, you're going to stop at number three, behavioral evaluation, and you're going to say, why are you sending them? Are they depressed? Um, are they suicidal? But if you're sending someone for, with a psych eval, asking for a psych eval, you don't need um, to talk about their life ball movement or necessarily their cardiovascular status or their lung and heart sounds. So again, we're trying to focus on the problem at hand. Appearance or assessment is a summary of the observations that the nurse has made. Um, initially when these forms were developed and this process was developed, the A in SBAR went for assessment, but because so many of our Nursing staff or LPNs and under Connecticut state statute are not able to perform patient assessments. It was changed to appearance. So this is where you get to kind of put near two sets. So if it's an RN, they might say um, patient appears to have worsening CHF, not responding to PR diuretics. If it's an LPN, they might say patient appears short of breath um, with awakening. So this is your chance to kind of help the receiving clinicians focus on what's really concerning you. And review and notify, that's just a section where you're going to say who you called and what they said. So it would be a rare instance, and it would certainly be an emergency, where a nurse in a nursing home did not call a physician or APRN prior to transfer to patient. So you just want to put the name of the person you called, what time you called, and any pertinent information they have. So if you called a doctor, an APRN, and they said, you know, I think you better send them to the ED for an x-ray. This is the section where you put them to the ED for an x-ray. Again, giving some guidance to the receiving clinician. So that's as far as I said before, if you've got um, anyone younger than me, trust are, are good that this is how they were trained, and this is something that we can fill out. Anytime you call a DOC or an APRN, anytime there's um, communication between clinicians, and if the thought of filling out the form is overwhelming, I would just encourage you to have it packed up in front of the phone because it's going to help the person sending the message structure it. So you're going to have something like, um, I'm here with Mrs. S. She seems to have gained weight. She's short of breath. She's having some difficulty talking. Her family's here. Um, she has a history of CHS, uh, recent change in diuresis or diuretics, whatever appearance assessment. If you're an RN, you might say, you know, I'm, I'm hearing some relevant from lung bases. 
feedback from Edema. I called the APRN and they suggested that she go into the emergency department, have a, an IV put in, and get some IV Lasix. That as opposed to, I'm here with this patient, she doesn't look very well and she's kind of huffing and puffing and I'm not sure what she has, but she's got a lot of stuff wrong with her and here's the list of her 27 diagnoses and she looks really rather awful and you know, we all have gone there. You know, you can kind of wander around, especially if you're the nurse sending a patient to the ED and you don't know this patient at all. So, again, we're just trying to help help the clinician focus on the problem at hand. All right, so that's something about SBAR. Again, um, I encourage you to explore it if you don't use it already. If you've got folks in your facility that know how to use SBAR, you might Think about having them give in services to um, their colleagues and peers because it's just a good way for us to get used to talking to each other. And, um, you know, anytime we improve communication between clinicians, we decrease frustration and improve collegial relationships overall. Okay, so we'll, we'll have a lot more patience with each other if we can speak to each other in a way that... Um, is clear and focused. So the next one I'm going to talk a little bit about is the nursing home transfer form. And this form, unlike that file that you can use any time you're calling a doc or an APRN, this form is really used um, during an acute care transfer. So that's, that's the whole purpose of this. And again, this one um, is sometimes viewed with horror as being too long. But just like with SBAR, we've got a lot of check boxes here, and there's going to be things that aren't applicable to the situation that you can just skip over. But what's on here that absolutely needs to be filled out, and it will be greatly appreciated by the clinicians receiving your resident in the ED, um, the contact person, you know, the residents next to kin, that's really important. Who to call at the nursing home to get questions answered? What a wonderful thing to know. Right, because chances are the ED doc or ED PA or APRN is going to call the nursing home and get the front desk and, and then um, have a long and frustrating journey around um, being transferred from one floor to another. So who sent the patient? That's really who, who they want to call. What RN sent the patient? Who decided that this patient needed to go to the ED? And the primary care clinician in the nursing home. Closed status. Very important. Um, usual mental status is so appreciated in an emergency department. Again, you know your residents. You know that they, you know, normally think that you're the vice president of the United States and, and it's 1972. But the ED clinician doesn't know that that's normal. And we'll go down a real bloody hole with a patient with dementia or, or any kind of psychiatric um, illness without knowing that. Usual functional status. If you have somebody who doesn't walk, the ED really needs to know that. If you have somebody who walks and they get to the ED and they don't walk, they need to know that too. Um, devices of treatment. Does this person need CPAP? Do they need oxygen? Precautions, which, you know, I know nursing homes are always really good about sending. Does the patient have MRSA or VRE? Allergies, risks, falls. Uh, just about anyone you send out of the nursing home probably is at risk for fall, but are they on anticoagulants, et cetera? Um, and here, at the end of this form, I know you can't really see it on this PowerPoint, but hopefully you'll be downloading these shortly and, and look go walking through them yourself. Nursing home would be able to accept the resident back under the following conditions. What an important piece of information. So you've got a couple of check boxes here. One is the ER determines the diagnosis and the treatment that can be done in the nursing home. So the ER assesses the patient, says they need some nebulizers for their chronic COPD. We're going to send them back to the nursing home. Um, vital signs are stabilized for somebody who is hypertensive or had rapid respiration or other. And there's a spot where you might say x-ray performed, no fracture. And then uh, who called it in and completed? 
On the other side of the North Central Transfer Forum, there's a lot more information, and, and that's kind of nice to have, but not a must-have. That's stuff like, is there a social worker? Does the resident need assistance with feeding? Um, their immunizations? I mean, it's all important stuff. Even cotton, it's, it's not as, as pertinent to an emergency department transfer. And that's the kind of stuff that perhaps if the, uh, the resident is admitted, um, the nursing supervisor or primary clinician might want to fill it out and send it over. So, the must have who to call for more information, and that should be either the nursing supervisor or whoever sent the patient, the code status usual mental status and functional status, um, clinical information, key clinical information, isolation precautions, and risk alerts. So this is going to replace the W-10 when set with a face sheet and a MAR. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But if you recall the W-10, if you still are using them, you know that there's a big old white space where you would handwrite a history. And over the years, ED clinicians have seen everything from a long, involved history that's several pages long to patient sick. So we know from safety science, we know from quality improvement in hospitals and nursing homes that checklists work. That's why you don't go to the grocery store without a list of what you're going to buy. That's why um, the folks that check the airplane before it takes off aren't given a blind piece of paper and told, look it over and tell us what you think. You need those prompts. They work. We know they work. So if, there, if there's any way to sell that to your staff, that idea to your staff, you really, you suck simply, especially in an emergency situation, you can't really remember these pertinent things. And you need those prompts. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the Red Envelope Initiative. We've been working on this now for, oh gosh, three years. Um, this is a process that's been adopted across the country. We've talked about what really needs to go with a resident the emergency department. An SBAR note, because that's really what it is, a nursing home transfer form, the MAR, of course, and the face sheet, because on the face sheet you have insurance information. But all these loose pieces of paper just sort of flap and fly around and, and get separated from each other. So the concept of putting them in a colored envelope that pops out was adapted by many nursing homes within our state and across the nation and seems to be working well. When we can get the left and going, and that has been a struggle, um, because even though it seems like a relatively simple process, a lot of hands touch this. A lot of different people have to be aware of this red envelope. So your staff needs to be aware that these communication forms and transfer forms are going in the envelope. The EMS staff needs to know to look for it. And once they get it, not open it, and bring it to the emergency department, and the emergency department staff needs to um, be aware that they need to look for it. So as simple as that might sound, we know how staff changes and migrates, and, and if we worked on this for the next 50 years, I guarantee there would be one eleven to 7 PRN, RN in the emergency department who'd say, I don't know what this is, I'm not going to take it. So <laughs> this is going to be a constant effort for us. But across our state, we've got three large communities who've agreed to adopt this practice. Um, Hartford, both St. Francis and Hartford Hospital, New Haven and Middletown are pleased to accept the red envelopes if you send them. We've been working with EMS, with other SNS, with um, ED physicians and ED case managers. Uh, my colleague Carol is planning to speak to the ED nurse managers at CHA in the next couple of months to remind them about this initiative. So if you want to know more about that, please contact us. Um, we've seen it work very well. A part of this process, though, is that all the documentation that goes within the envelope, that goes inside the envelope, also has to be given to the EMS. In the state of Connecticut, um, 
EMS workers or providers need that level of documentation, and, and sometimes, you know, we're puzzled by that, but if you saw that they do with it on the other end, they keep meticulous statistics, they use it for their orders, um, and they treat in transport, and, and they need that information. So that's going to be part of the process, too, and chances are pretty good that's already been part of your process, so if you've been making double copies of these. If you've got points of care, you can just print out to if you don't, you have to figure out a way to get those copies made because the EMS is going to want the SR. They're going to want the transfer form. Um, they actually even want the MAR on the face sheet. All right. So we talked about what's going in the envelope. Um, I'm going to just go over that one more time. I guess I got ahead of myself here. The capabilities list, absolutely. You want to let the emergency department know what your nursing home can do. Can they do IVs? Can they do TPN? Can they do um, And again, that can be pre filled if it's reviewed every six months or so. The acute care transfer checklist, so it's on the outside of the envelope, and um, most nursing homes pretend, prefer to have these envelopes pre made. So you buy a box of red envelopes, and you just slip that capabilities list in them all. Um, pack the acute care transfer checklist, staple that on the outside. That's just a checklist that lets the receiving physicians know what should be in that envelope, what you put in the envelope. Again, the, the transfer form, the S-bar, the MAR, and the face sheet. Advanced directives if you have them. Um, I guess I can't stop talking about this. <laughs> so I'll definitely know what goes in this envelope by the time I finish this presentation. Um, the red envelope should only be opened by the ED staff and the EMS staff should have their own copies, as I said earlier. Okay, I'm going to switch gears for a second um, and talk about process mapping and talk about how to change processes in a way that will um, result in some sustainability and some staff buy-in. So process mapping is a quality improvement tool that we use a lot when we're designing new processes. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I'll give you a brief overview of what it is. Um, it's a method for displaying processes that illustrates how a transaction happens. So you're going to provide a visual representation of exactly what happens in a transaction or process. It should be done in enough detail to allow people unfamiliar with the process to understand it. So by the time you've finished this exercise, anyone should be able to look at it and say, oh, I can see exactly how this happens. Um, if you've never done it, I would encourage you to do it with your staff. We would be happy to come out and show you how to do it. It's a way of engaging staff, and it's kind of fun. And it can be very, very um, illuminating, should I say, because you'll see that staff do things that you probably never realized they were doing, and that there will be people who do it one way and other people who do it another way. It makes you kind of question um, what's the best way. Another thing that process mapping often reveals is steps that are unnecessary, redundancies, and inefficiencies. So I'm going to give you a quick example of how that might look. I'm going to talk about feeding my cat. So if I was going to process flow exactly how I feed my cat, put the bowl on the counter, open the door. The little diamond on this indicates a decision. Wet food or dry food for frisky. Um, if it's dry food, I'm going to open the bag and pour it in the bowl. If it's wet food, I'm going to get a can opener. Now, all through this process, when I process float it, I realized that the cat jumps on the counter. If you have a cat, perhaps your cat does this too. The cat jumps on the counter, and I have to pick the cat up and put the cat back on the floor. So I have to do that several times. So in process flowing this, I can see that if the cat was in the room with me, I would save time. There would be at least three steps that could be eliminated. So if I wanted to do this quicker, I would 
put the cat in the living room, close the kitchen door, and then I could skip removing the cat from the counter and placing her on the floor, which, according to this precious flow, I have done at least three times. So those are the kind of things that you're looking for when you flow a process. Is there redundancies? Is there inefficiencies? Um, am I walking across the room when the thing that I'm reaching for could be placed closer? So, how do we do this? Well, you want to get a group of people, in this case nurses, and maybe even EMS folks if you've got any that are interested in working with you, that are familiar with the process, that are familiar with the process of transferring a patient to the emergency department. The easiest way is to use sticky notes um, and stick them on the wall, or a blackboard will do. And again, you're going to do a step-by-step -step documentation of all things we do to send a patient to the emergency department. You're looking for redundancies, rework, inefficiencies, and again, when you've assembled a group of people, you'll find that some people do it one way, other people do it another way. That's also something you want to look at because there might be two best ways to do something, but chances are there are seven best ways to do something. Now, the process for assembling documentation, sending it a patient to an emergency department is very, very complex, as you well know, much more complex than feeding my cat. So you're going to have a lot more steps, and it's going to take a lot more time to document that. So, as a very, very brief overflow, um, I mean, overview, let's look at what it might entail. So you've assessed a resident. You've decided that this resident is sick, that their condition is getting worse. You've done some vital signs, asked about pain, called the supervisor, called the APRN, called the ambulance. Um, we're all through this process at many different junctures. I'm sure you're going to reassure the resident and their family and keep them informed. You're going to document the assessment. And most people are going to do that at the very, very end of um, the assessment process and the process of transferring them. Just to ask yourself if that's really the best way to do that because it's easy to drop things, it's easy to forget things if you don't write them down as they're happening. So to give a report to EMS, copy the MAR, copy the documentation, assemble everything into a pile, hand it to the, the um, EMS staff and also go. So this is very high level. Um, if you assembled your staff to actually walk through the process of transferring a resident to the emergency department, I'm sure there'd be at least 40 steps. So I'm just kind of roughing this out to give you an example of how this might look. So you've identified the existing process. You've looked at obstacles, you've walked through it. Once you've got all those sticky notes up on the wall or all those sticky notes up on the blackboard, you ask people to stop by, leave them up there for a few days, ask them to stop by, look it over, um, do they see anything different, do they see anything that might be added. And after it's been hanging up there on the wall or wherever you put it, regroup with your staff and, and look at it again and say, okay, have we really captured the way we do this? So once you know the existing process, you can move towards redesigning it in a thoughtful manner. So using that example I just gave you, say you're going to implement interact and communication tools. So you're going to take the existing process and decide where you're going to insert the new steps. So now you might assist the resident, do the vital signs, and then do the SBAR, and then call the supervisor and the APRN. Remember, because SBAR is a communication tool that we're using to structure the communication with the supervisor and APRN. So SBAR is going to come before that call. Even if you're not writing it down, you're thinking that way, okay? Maybe after the call, you're actually writing on the SBAR, calling the ambulance, reassuring the resident, again, embedded through the whole process, report out. EMS, and then we're going to figure out where those other forms should go. Maybe you complete the transfer form before the EMS goes there. Maybe you after. But again, this is this is up to your staff 
to design a process that seems to work for them. Once it's in place, it's, again, it's going to be a, a moving, changing, evolving thing. So now you have a new process. You can share with people, this is the way we think this should flow. This is the way we think um, this work can get done in the most efficient manner. Give it a couple of months, and then process flow it again. And is it working? Are there redundancies? Is there room for improvement? So again, I'd encourage you to try this exercise because it's a lot of fun. It gets people talking. It gets people involved. Um, we learn a lot about what we do and how we do it. And there's usually some surprises, and then there's always um, a bit of, gosh, why did we bother doing that? That doesn't seem that important. So it gives people a chance to consciously and thoughtfully change behavior in a way that's, that's going to yield some results. And you're welcome to call us if you'd like any help with that. So I hope you'll try to implement this process. We appreciate that it's complicated, that it um, represents a big change for a lot of facilities. Um, some of the things I've seen work in nursing homes that successfully implemented the interact tools in the red envelope process, um, some of them did dry runs. In other words, like drills, we're going to pretend that we're transferring a, a resident and we're going to walk through this. That way we can figure out where these forms should be. Um, that's what I learned about prepackaging the red envelope, having the, the um, checklist on the outside and the capabilities list inside. Um, one of the nursing homes that we worked with came up with that idea. You know, in, in terms of what's going to work for you, you know, I, every nursing home is going to be a little bit different. But I, I would encourage you when you're sharing this with your staff to, to communicate that this isn't just about more forms or more documentation. So when you go to implement Interact Tools, you've got to take something away. So if you're saying that they're going to do a SFR, then Eliminate the transfer note. If you're saying that they're going to do a transfer um, checklist, eliminate something else. This, that we need to do that work trading. We can't just add and add and add work. We're not trying to work harder. We're trying to work smarter. So look at the information that's contained in these interact tools, and if there's any redundancies, eliminate them. So if you have a, a policy that says that you have to do a transfer note, take that away and, and replace it with the SR and the, um, the nursing home transfer form. Whenever possible, you want to eliminate duplicate documentation for many reasons. One is that it's wasteful, it frustrates and infuriates the people you ask to do it, and it also is a, a point of failure. Chances are if you're asked to document something two or three times, you're going to document it differently and it becomes sort of a, a medical legal pitfall. So, again, I, I would put in a plug for process mapping, look at the way you do it already, then map out your new process using Interact Tools, looking for redundancies, looking for ways to make it smoother, and know that we're here to help you. And I thank you for your time, and that's the most I've talked for a long time. I'm done talking for the day. Okay, thank you, Sheila. This is Carol again. Thank you. That was excellent. That was um, the best presentation I've heard about the uh, communication tools on Interact in a long time. So thank you, thank you. So the next couple of minutes, we're going to be talking about our homework from last month. Um, and then we're going to be giving you out your homework for this month. So um, hopefully everyone is ready to um, share. Um, and in order for us to open up the phone lines, it's going to be pound, pound six. So, um, so as I'm reviewing the homework from se 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 session five, which was just last month, um, be ready to, to share your, your successes or your challenges so others can hear by um, hitting pound six to open up your phone lines. So last session, um, we reviewed the Interact QI tool. 
We discussed um, your at your next t at your team meeting. You were supposed to discuss when and how the staff nurses, your supervisors, and your um, your leadership and your medical director were going to be educated on the use of this tool. And you were going to decide which unit, which nurse, which patient, or which um, yeah, which nurse will be the first one to use the QI tool. So you want to always start small, see how the process goes, tweak it a little, try it again, and then you start spreading with another patient or another incident um, or any time you have an acute care transfer. Um, so you want to, again, start small and then spread. Also during your team meeting, you're supposed to develop a timeline to define when the education will occur about the use of this tool. Um, and again, the QI tool is used after any acute care, uh, acute transfer to the hospital. And the, um, the plan will include a de debrief by the team and the participating staff as to how things went after the tool is used for the first time. With that being said, Let's have a group discussion. So again, pound six to open up your line. We would like to um, have a discussion about um, did you have any lessons learned or successes or barriers that you want to share as you develop your process for educating your staff on the QI tool, on implementing the tool, or using the tool for the first time? Or how about when your team um, used the tool and then you talked about it afterwards, that's what a debrief is, you know, how did it go? You know, what were the lessons learned? Or how did it go talking to your leadership or your medical director? Or if you have used this tool as you did a case review during one of your community meetings, because we know several of the communities that we are, are part of um, use, use this tool when, there is, when they are reviewing um, cases for um, readmission. So would anyone like to... Be the first to open up um, pound six, to open up your line, to tell me how um, things are going with the quality improvement tool. Hi, this is Shelly at Joe's. Hi, Shelly. How are you? Good. I'll just share one thing that we've done uh, briefly. Um, over the past few months, our CNAs now document on tablets, and we okay. incorporated stop and watch like into their tasks so that they, if they notice something that they're, you know, with their residents, they can simply go to the tablet and then we can see it because we are PCC. We can look at what they've documented on our dashboard. Um, and because we do our morning report on the individual floors, if we know that things happened, we actually talk to the CNA right then and there about were you able to do the stop and watch. And if they didn't, it was more like a reminder that it's present there that they could, um, you know, don't forget to do it. So it's like a constant reminder to them to bring things okay. forward. Sure. That's really how many, uh, yeah, how many stop and watches do you think are completed on a weekly basis? Now, um, another complaint. Well, I think it's still a work in progress. I would say 10 to 15, maybe. Wow, that's excellent. So yeah, that's I think they're doing. 15, yeah, 10 to 15 times that um, a patient is, is getting that extra look over because that stop and watch has been filled out. That's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. I'm sorry, I had cut you off, please. If you can remember what your thought was. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think it's um, a matter of a constant reminder to them. And always, um, you know, when new staff come in, because um, we do a couple of orientations a month, it's just, I mean, I think you always have to remind them to do it. And yeah. that even the simplest things um, yeah. can be significant. Absolutely. So. And that's key. And that, so, so the little things don't get into big things. So absolutely, right. that's exactly why staff and watch is so important. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. That's a great best practice. Thank you. Thank you. Shelly, we're going to steal that and spread it everywhere. If you want, we'll name it after you. <laughs> <laughs> that's 
Okay, so let's get back to the um, quality improvement tool. Anyone want to share um, the first time you used it? How did it go? Or why haven't you used it? How about that? So pound six to open up your line. Michael, Michael P, how about if you hit pound six to let us know how you're doing with the quality improvement tool? How about Krista Wagner? Krista, how are you doing with the quality improvement tool? Or any tool. <laughs> or, any, or any tool, exactly. Or any tool. Pound six. This is an opportunity to share with your colleagues how things are going, what you like, what you don't like about it. It's re this is a really important time for you. Or you can put a comment or question in chat. Well, this is Shelley again. <laughs> I can share what we do here with our QI tool. It's more of a, it's more for us, um, maybe what we, um, in regards to rehospitalization, we look at these, every time we send someone to the hospital, we do look at, at the whole process. Um, we do all the tools for the, the interact tools, but what we mostly do is within 24 hours we review every discharge to the hospital and we um, we have a, a daily call with our medical director and we decide was there something that we could have picked up sooner like um, what you know could we have presented it in any way and um, you know that's also where our capabilities list comes in so it's a matter of educating all our supervisors um, to be confident in what we can do here diagnostically too. So we do we do a lot with rehospitalization and we do those um, that tool every day. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you must be learning something every time you use it, I'm sure. But we do. Yes. I mean, not not just me, I mean all our nursing staff. Yeah. Um, yeah, they have a big part in that. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And uh, that's you get, get some aha moments. Well, thank you, Shelley. I won't I won't torture anyone else any further, demanding that they talk to me. But I'm going to read you quickly the homework for this session. Um, I'd encourage everyone to go to the Interact website and download the SBAR form, the Nursing Home Transfer form, Acute Care Transfer Checklist and the capabilities list. Um, if you're not using a red envelope, see if you can figure out a way to get a box and start working on that. Um, look at where your copiers are, your size, how can you make this most efficient, how you can uh, reduce any kind of rework or redundancies that aren't helpful in the process. And consider doing a process flow map. Like I said, there are a lot of fun, they engage people. And just like what Shelly was saying about risk analysis and um, the QI tool, it becomes a real learning opportunity. But at the very least, I'm going to encourage everyone to at least look at these forms so everyone can grasp at how long they are. And then maybe consider giving them to your staff and asking them to fill them out on a, you know, imaginary patient, because once people start using them, you realize that they really aren't as intimidating as they seem. They're just prompting you to think in a certain way, and you're just kind of going through the things that are pertinent and ignoring the ones that aren't. So we're right at the top of the hour. Again, I thank you for your time and attention. It means a lot to us to know that our nursing home partners are so committed 
to improving care and safety for residents, um, especially as I get closer to that age myself. <laughs> I'm glad I live in Connecticut. And thank you all again for your time and attention, and we will see you next month. Thank you all for a great discussion, and a few announcements will become the today's call. A reminder that we are now on social media. You can visit us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. When you close out of this webinar, the evaluation will automatically pop up on your computer. If you please fill that out, we'd greatly appreciate it. If you don't have time to fill out the evaluation right now, or you're currently sharing your computer with someone, you will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the evaluation, as well as a link to the event page on our website. PowerPoint presentation was in your day of that details email and will be posted on the website as well. Within the next few business days, a recording and transcript of this webinar will also be added. Thank you again so much for attending and have a great day. Bye. The leader has disconnected. The conference will be terminated in five minutes.